Good evening, and on behalf of the University of Chicago's Institute of Politics, welcome to this Democratic Gubernatorial Forum. I'm David Axelrod, the founding director of the Institute of Politics, where one of our organizing principles is that elections matter. One of these men could be the next governor of Illinois, and yes, they all are men, uh, and they will have to deal with uh, many challenges facing this state. The decisions the next governors make, the next governor will make, will impact on lives of millions of people uh, across our state uh, and their communities. So what they say tonight is important. And what we hope is that what you hear tonight will help you make your decisions about who should lead this state. We're proud to be the host of this uh, forum here from the Logan Center on the University of Chicago campus and proud to be partnered uh, with WBEZ and Politico tonight. And now, uh, join me in welcoming our host and our moderator for tonight, Mel Ballara from WBEZ. Thank you, David Axelrod, and welcome to the Illinois Democratic Gubernatorial Candidates Forum. Thanks to our partners tonight, Politico and the University of Chicago Institute of Politics. And welcome to our WBEZ listeners, those joining us on Facebook, and those on Illinois Public Radio member stations statewide. We're about to hear from the six candidates who hope to be the next governor of Illinois. The Democratic candidates are here to answer questions about a variety of topics, to help the voters make up their minds ahead of the primary election in just three weeks. With us tonight, in the order they appear on the election ballot are, and hold your applause for a moment, J.B. Pritzker, Chris Kennedy, State Senator Daniel Biss, Bob Diber, T.O. Hardiman, and Dr. Robert Marshall. Let's welcome them with applause tonight. Mm -hmm. Now, this is not a formal debate. Not all the candidates are going to answer all of the questions. They will answer, answer some of the questions, and some will get individual questions. If they filibuster, I will interrupt them. They'll also be answering questions from our reporters, WBEZ's Dave McKinney, WBEZ's Tony Arnold, and Politico's Natasha Korecki, as well as questions that were submitted by the public. And join us after the broadcast on WBEZ's Facebook page as we continue live with additional questions from the audience. So let's begin with two questions tonight about jobs and taxes. Our first question is for all the candidates. And we'll begin with State Senator Daniel Biss. In 2015, Illinois created 81,000 jobs. In 2016, just 18,000. In 2017, still a low 29,000. If you are elected governor, how many jobs are you going to create in your first term in office? Well, I think we need to look at our current unemployment rate, which is now just under 5%. I plan to get it down to 4%. But let's talk about the fact that different parts of Illinois are experiencing different levels of unemployment. The number is almost 50% worse in the Latino community and not far from three times as bad in the African American community. My plan is to have not just unemployment of 4%, but equality across Illinois for all communities. Bob Diver. Yes, you know, if Illinois is going to grow jobs, we need an aggressive marketing plan. And as I've done with other policies, I'll put a real number with this. As governor, I'll create 120,000 new jobs in this state, and I'll do it by two ways. I'll expand our transportation log dis district and distribution centers in the state of Illinois. The two major hubs are, are in Joliet and in Madison County. They have proven to create more jobs each year. And T.O. We'll Hardiman, let's move on to you. Yeah, T.O. Hardiman, I would first, I support House Bill 453, which is a financial transaction tax that's project, projected to bring in $3 billion of new revenue. I will use that revenue to create 100,000 new jobs here in Illinois. The unemployment rate for African American people in Illinois is 14.2%, the highest in the nation. Unemployment for African American youth between ages of 20 and 24, Chicago Peoria and Decatur, is 43 to 50%. We have to do something to change the numbers and reduce the unemployment in all communities. Dr. Robert Marshall, your plan. Well, unemployment is high because taxes are high. So I'm opposed to any tax increases. Specifically, though, we need to create jobs two ways. Number, number one, legalize marijuana throughout this state. That'll create 10 to 20, 30, 40,000 jobs, growing it and selling it. The other thing is legalizing casino gambling in Chicago. 
There's 55 million uh, visitors to Chicago, and that'll create 20, 30, 40,000 jobs right there. J.B. Pritzker. Well, I'm the only candidate on this stage that's created thousands and thousands of jobs. I founded 1871, which has created more than 7,000 jobs in hundreds of companies, and I've created thousands of jobs in my own business. I think you need a governor who understands that two-thirds of all the jobs that get created in the state of Illinois are created by small businesses. You also need a governor who's not bad-mouthing the state and inviting other governors to bad-mouth the state so that other large businesses don't want to move here. I believe during my first term that I could create hundreds of thousands of jobs in the state of Illinois. Chris Kennedy? Well, I just dispute uh, J.B. Pritzker's uh, statement that he's created more jobs in Illinois than anybody else on the stage. I think if there's an award for that, it would go to me. I think in terms of our job creation over the next couple of years, we need to look at great models. And I would look at what they've done in Massachusetts, where they created 65,000 jobs to an equivalent number here of about 35,000 using the great universities and colleges that are present there. We can adopt that system to Illinois and have great results. Mr. Prisker, do you have a response to Mr. Kennedy? Well, it's kind of ironic that uh, uh, Mr. Kennedy is raising the issue of universities. He raised tuition five times when he was the chairman of the University of Illinois, uh, almost 30% rise in tuition, and it drove students from in-state to out-of-state and people of color away from the University of Illinois. I believe that during my term in office, we can create hundreds of thousands of jobs. We've got to focus on the fact that we've got the best talent and we've got the most educated, dedicated workforce in the entire nation. We need to invest in that and make it easier We're for kids move to on. stay in the uh, state Mr. of Pritzker, Illinois. Mr. Pritzker, we're going to move on. A question now for all the candidates. All of you, except Dr. Marshall, support increasing taxes on some Illinoisans with a graduated income tax. What do you say to voters who are sick of getting their taxes increased and maybe considering the Republican candidate in November who's promising to cut taxes? Tio Hardiman, let's start with you. Well, first and foremost, I'm asking everybody to, vote, everybody to vote for Tio Hardiman because I have nothing to do with that mess down there, okay? But let me say this, everybody. I support the progressive tax, which we can tax the wealthy people according to their income status, and I have a scale from 1 to 10%. You tax people making 50000 or less about at a 2% rate. Anybody making $100,000 or more, 4 to 5%. Anybody making, I'll just go to the top of the scale. Anybody making a million dollars to a billion dollars a year, they should be paying 8 to 10% taxes. I think that's fair, and the progressive tax can bring in another projected $3 billion of new revenue here in the state of Are Illinois. you at all concerned, Mr. Hardiman, that people that would be paying 10% tax might just leave the state? Well, I mean, this the thing. I believe people will stay here in the state because, you know, I'm not here. See, I, I plan to take the high road during my, you know, conversation in this here race. The reality is that billionaires in particular have been getting away without paying their fair share of taxes. I did some research. You only have 17 billionaires that live in Illinois. If all the billionaires supported each other, they would receive 17 votes. Bob I'm, Diver, the, I'm the poor people's plan? champion. I just well, want to put that out there. What would you say to someone you know, who says they don't want to pay more taxes? Well, it's like this. If you adopt the Diver tax plan, the majority of the working class people actually save money on their income tax because the working poor, those making $45,000 or less, would only pay 2.25% in income tax because they need earning power. You know, we have people running for governor that pay no income tax. You know, look at Senator Biss, and he can respond to this. I want to know how much state income tax he paid in two of the last five years when he reported no federal. You know, we have too many loopholes in our tax system. So I'm for this. I don't believe anybody leaves a state because you ask millionaires to pay more. Because there's more millionaires that live in Long Island than any other place in the United States. And Let's they're hear paying now from 18%. Dan state Senator Daniel Biss. I'm glad we're having this conversation. I think Democrats should lean right into this conversation and say to the people of Illinois, listen, if our tax system feels unfair to you, you're right. It's regressive, it's broken, it's unfair because of who has been in control for so very long, working for themselves. My wife and I pay over 10% of our income in property taxes. That's normal in the state of Illinois. It's not normal in most parts of the country, and it's because of a broken system. It's time for us to do what I've been calling for for a decade and amend the Constitution, create a progressive income tax, and allow us to have property taxes that are reasonable. By the way, we shouldn't stop there. We ought to tax financial transactions. We ought to accept that we've moved to a new financial economy. Daniel Biss, very so doing, briefly, both you and Teal Hardiman have mentioned the financial mm -hmm. transaction tax. We have had one of the CEOs from one of the trading, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, say that they'll leave the state 
if that tax is enacted. What's your plan B, considering if that tax is enacted, we could lose three to six billion dollars every year? What's your response? Well, to be clear, plan A is to amend the Constitution to allow for a progressive income tax. That is the most important thing we can do. It's solving the original sin in Illinois budgeting. But let's just back up for a second. Let us not allow the CEO of the biggest financial firm in the state to set our tax policy. And That's Hardiman, exactly yeah. what we've been doing wrong all this time. What's your response to these first companies and, leaving the first state? First and foremost, as the governor, I would meet with all the corporations and talk to them about the need for the financial transaction tax. It's only a nickel on a quarter. It's not a lot of money. It's projected to bring in $3 billion of new revenue. So as a governor, I would have to be a peacemaker, a broker, and negotiate with them and ask them to stay here by providing an effective leadership. Chris it's Kennedy, let's go back to you with the original question. What do you say to voters who may be considering the Republican candidate because they're sick of taxes being raised? Um, well, I think we've got a terrible system in Illinois, and I think there's easy ways to fix it. It doesn't have to be like this. We can fully fund our government. We can move to a progressive income tax. We can go the long-term route by opening up the state constitution, go the short-term route, use the Massachusetts model of a synthetic progressive income tax. We need to close the loopholes that allow uh, internet sales in Illinois that don't pay their fair share of our sales tax. We need to close the loophole that allow people to live in states like Florida, claim they live there, work here, collect a paycheck, and not pay local income tax. Let's move we, on now to very briefly, if you want to finish. I, I would if I could. Very briefly. Okay. Very briefly. And, and, and then we, we need to file under valuation complaints at the state level against the egregious examples of sweetheart deals that assessors are giving their friends. And we'll have more time to hear from you on that. J.B. Pritzker, what do you say to taxpayers that are tired of increased taxes? Well, we need a progressive income tax in this state so that we can lower local property taxes and pay for schools. We need a quality education for every child in the state of Illinois. And truly, businesses and jobs get created in states that have quality, quality education where we're producing the talent that businesses need. But, you know, Dan Biss, just a few years ago, had a different position on this. He voted for an $85 million tax break for the exchanges and gave the very argument that I would give against the transaction tax, which is those businesses will simply get up and leave. Those jobs will be gone, and the revenue that they produce today for us will be gone. Mr. Biss, your response. Yeah, I've, I'm a little bit confused about what the point that's being made here. Here's the bottom line. Our economy has changed, our economy has transformed, and our tax system is trapped for an economy that no longer exists. We'll have if to we leave want, it there. What's that? We'll have to leave it there. No, right. Let's bring in our reporters no, now. May I answer the question? Mr. Marshall, you are against any taxes being raised, is that right? Yeah, but I... Yeah, if I'd you like have to something to say, I, jump in, please. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, well, he, she's right. I'm against uh, yeah, all tax increases. Income, gasoline, et cetera, et cetera. But I guess I'm against this graduated income tax. And there are 12 reasons. Look on my website, citizensforrobertmarshall.net. 12 reasons why I'm against the graduated income tax. I'll pick one. It taxes labor, it taxes work. How do people get into these higher incomes, 100, 200, 300? My experience, they get there by working hard or working more than 40 hours a week. So all these five candidates are going to come to them and say, you have to pay a higher percentage because you're working harder, working more than 40 hours a week. How is that fair? I'm against it. Thank you very much, Robert Marshall. Let's go now to our reporters. We'll begin with Natasha Karecki of Politico. Mr. Pritzker. FBI tapes of you talking with former Governor Rod Blagojevich have been widely circulating in television ads. The timing of those discussions, your own request to Blagojevich for an appointment, and your remarks about African-American politicians have caused your opponents to say you're unelectable in the fall. Why should Democratic voters have confidence you can win in November? Well, 10 years ago, I spoke with the governor to recommend to him that he appoint Secretary of State Jesse White to the Senate seat that Barack Obama was vacating, becoming President of the United States. I think Jesse White is a great public servant in the state. Now, when I'm wrong, I say I'm wrong, and I was wrong on that call. And I take responsibility for that. But remember that millions of dollars are being spent by Bruce Rauner to try and defeat me in this Democratic primary. He's not spending money against any of my opponents. Why is that? Because he knows that he can't win in a general election against me. 
Now, just a couple of weeks ago, Chris Kennedy stood up and applauded Bruce Rauner and said that Bruce Rauner speaks truth to power, that Bruce Rauner thinks that the economy is, that he's doing a good job improving the economy. I think that's wrong. I think Bruce Rauner Mr. is a failure. Mr. Pritzker, if I could just a quick follow up. Um, do you believe you've repaired any damage that those remarks have made with the African American community? You know, I've spent decades working with the African American community to get real things done for African American families, like school breakfasts all across the state of Illinois for low income uh, kids, and making sure that we provide quality preschool, quality child care, hundreds of jobs. Um, and I believe that people will look past the political attacks on me and instead see my real record of standing up for social and economic justice. Let's hear just a moment from Mr. Kennedy. Yes. Uh, your comments about Governor Rauner were widely reported. What's your response? Well, Governor Rauner's been one of the worst governors in the entire country, one of the worst in Illinois history, including those who went to jail. But when he spoke out against the pay-to-play, well, it's true. When he spoke out against the pay-to-play political system that J.B. Pritzker has emerged as the poster child for, he was not wrong. What J.B. says in those tapes, he uses the language, language of racists, not language of politicians, and not language of leaders. And then he says, it's OK because I gave so much money to political candidates in the African American community. If you go back and look at that claim, you see that it is not right. Less than 20% of 1%, less than a fifth of 1% of his political donations went to African Americans in a state like Illinois. Can I add? We're going to follow up. Can I just add? A, we're just going to follow up in just <laughs> right. a moment. But we do have to get to this question from WBEZ's Tony Arnold. Mr. Kennedy, uh, one of the ways that your campaign began uh, was when you lost your temper at a reporter who followed you to an elevator to ask you some basic questions about your campaign. More recently, you refused to say anything nice about one of your opponents on this stage when asked during a cam candidate forum, why do you think you have the temperament to be governor? Why do I have a, the, the, temperament the temperament to be governor? Um, well, obviously, I needed a little work on that elevator pitch at the beginning of the campaign. And, and I think I've developed as a candidate in that way. But I'm a peacemaker. I'm a middle child. I've spent my whole life bringing people together. I ran 90 trade shows a year with 10,000 exhibiting companies all over North America, over a million visitors to those trade shows. When I was 27, 28 years old, I was elected chairman of the board of the Greater Chicago Food Depository. I was elected by my peers, 2,000 of them, to be the chairman of the Chicago Convention and Tourism Bureau. Five times I was elected chairman of the University of Illinois. On the three corporate boards I sit on, all of them have asked me to play leadership roles among those boards. In every instance, I've been asked to bring people together, and that's what I'm good at. Let's move on now to a question from WBEZ's Dave McKinney. Senator Biss, you were a leader in trying to overhaul Illinois' troubled pension system, but the 2013 law you helped write wound up being declared unconstitutional. Now you describe your advocacy as a, quote, false choice. Politicians change their minds. But how do you expect voters to believe that with anything you stand for, you're not eventually going to do a 180-degree turn and chalk it up to, as you call it, a learning experience? I don't think it's a matter of a 180 degree turn. It's a matter of struggling with a difficult issue as I did from day one in the legislature instead of shirking away from it, rejecting some proposed solutions, trying to do my best with the options available. As you said, being too quick to accept a false choice, being too quick to accept a false choice that articulated that the only options available to the state were to make changes to pension benefits or to make further cuts to social services. I've acknowledged that, that was a false choice, and I think that learning lesson has been clear from my record. But here's the most important part of this, Dave. Nobody on this stage, nobody on this stage will be a perfect governor in January of 2019. Oh, speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> what I think my wrestling with this difficult issue, working through a series of attempts, coming out with the right point of view shows is that I'll be a better governor in February of 2019 than I am in January, and yet a better governor in March of 2019 than February. By contrast, J.B. Pritzker was funding an organization that took much more extreme positions in 2011, but instead of acknowledging it and talking about what he's learned, he pretended it didn't happen. We're going to pause that there, State Senator Daniel Biss. That is a failure Daniel of Biss. character. Let him respond. So tell, uh, just a moment. We are listening to the Illinois Democratic Primary Forum for Governor from the University of Chicago Institute of Politics, Politico, and WBEZ. Mr. Prisker, your response. Thank you. Well, 
Dan Biss likes to say that he'd be a middle class governor, but he hasn't stood up for the middle class. He, in fact, introduced that pension bill that took 450,000 workers' pensions away, including teachers and nurses across the state. And that's not good for the middle class. And it wasn't good for the middle class when he voted with Republicans to garnish people's wages who are struggling to pay their student loans. So, you know, the challenge, Dan, is you're just not who you say you are. Let me Let's respond to that, on. please, because I think JB really illustrated my point. Well, what we don't want he to do is He was given the opportunity. Well, yeah. We have plenty of questions tonight that we're trying to get to. Can we're going to move on to Natasha Krakic. JB Prisker, we, Chris Kennedy, and Daniel Biss are not the only ones running for governor. And we understand I'm running for governor as well. We have a question coming for you, right. and it's coming in a moment from Natasha Krakic of Politico. Okay, we're going to start with Mr. Deber. Money alone doesn't win elections, but it is necessary to running a competitive campaign, especially against a well-funded Republican opponent. Mr. Diber, you raised just seventy-two hundred in the last seventy-two hundred dollars in the last fundraising filing period. What's more, a poll from the Paul Simon Public Policy Institute this week shows you with support from just one percent of registered voters. Why should Democrats trust you to beat a Republican candidate in the fall? Because all these gentlemen have agreed to come together to support me after the primary, so I have all their support. You know, I'm the one guy that doesn't get caught up in bickering. I'm the guy that gets along with most ever person. I'm the guy that has the most support from organized labor, from teachers. And I'm the individual that really is a middle class uh, Democrat. You know, I'm not from wealth, and I appreciate you acknowledging that. You know, my family can't write me a $100,000 check or a wealthy neighbor. I don't come from that neighborhood of people where $100,000 is a drop in the bucket. Uh, I, I wasn't born into a billionaire family. I, I d didn't come from a rich political family. I came from a democratic family. That's where I came from, from a working mother who is a teamster, who is a father who is self-employed. That's the way I raised my family. And I want to tell you this. I have won more elections than these guys will in their lifetime. I've won 11. I've got more votes than all these guys put together from the residents of the state of Illinois, and I can win another one, and I've never lost a primary. So that's why Democrats vote for Bob Diber, because he's a true Democrat. What you see on the stage are people that haven't won elections, have never served a day in office, and don't understand how to govern, and on the first day of the job, I can do it, and people believe in me. Okay, Natasha, you have a follow-up. Just a, just a quick follow-up. There, you know, there is an opportunity to get small donations, as small as twenty-five dollars, um, or even less. Um, are you have you demonstrated that you're able to get that kind of support, even at a lower level? Sure, I got uh, a twenty-five dollar donation last night. I got a hundred dollar <laughs> donation the night before, and forty-five the day before, and two hundred and sixty-two the day before. So you know, uh, you know, open up your checkbooks tonight. Go to That's Act right. Blue, That's Diver right. for Governor. Yeah. We did that at NBC and it worked. So let's keep the checks rolling in from everywhere up Lakeshore and uh, the north part on. of the city. Okay. Thanks. Miss, Mr. Hardiman, same yeah. question to you. You raised even less money in the last fundraising cycle um, and you're polling at 2%. Why should Democratic primary voters entrust you mm -hmm. with their vote? Well, first of all, I'm the only candidate that ran for governor in 2014. The polls had me at 5%. We closed out with 28.1% of the state vote. I have a proven track record. I'm the only candidate up here. My strategy is to be recognized as the middle class and poor people's champion. I would like to be seen as an alternative to the billionaire candidates up here. I'm the only African-American professional running for governor. When them tapes came out, and I don't have an issue with JB, I want to make that clear, but when those tapes came out, I have an issue with some of the black pastors that, that continue to sell out the black community apologizing for JB and some of the black aldermen that are apologizing for JB as if they made them comments. That's why I have my issue with. I'm running to represent everybody in the state of Illinois and I haven't even tried to raise a whole lot of money because we're doing good. I've taken an internal poll, we're at 18%. Everywhere I go, people know we're running for governor, they're supporting us. I need money just like Bob, but I plan to be an alternative to the billionaires and that's what I want everybody in Illinois to understand understand about our campaign. Thank you, Thank you very Hardiman. Much. Let's Appreciate move on that. to a question from WBEZ's Tony Arnold. This, this question is coming for you. Okay. Dr. I'm Marshall. The same uh, one of your top priorities is to break up Illinois into three separate states. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any evidence that anyone but you supports doing this. Oh, You're polling at 1%, and you've also previously run for office as a Republican. Now, you've criticized your opponents on this stage for being unelectable in the fall. Why should Democratic primary voters trust you can win in November? That's an awful lot. 
if you if you're satisfied with the establishment, Mr. Madigan, don't vote for me. There's five candidates here who represent the establishment. I don't represent the establishment. I have new ideas that nobody has. Legalizing marijuana, casino gambling, putting the tolls on the entrances to the state so the out-of-stayers pay. And the, and the biggest one of all is dissolving the state of Illinois and replacing it with three brand new states. Chicago, Chicago will be its own brand new state, own governor, new constitution. The suburbs will be the second. Everything below Route 80 will be the third state. And you're wrong. As I go around, and especially downstate, and the African-American community in Chicago, they like this idea. If you were a minority in Chicago, think about it. You will have your own state overnight. You will have an enormous amount. You will have a, you'll, you'll have a large percentage of the population. You have Dr. Varsha, are, are you concerned that you potentially could be creating, say, four new Republican U.S. senators and Democratic voters might not be too happy about that? If it's, if it's elected democratically, what's wrong with that? It'd be six senators. You could, if it's elected democratically, it's a democratic state. I don't think you'd come up with that, uh, that many. We're a democracy. What's wrong if, they, if, it's, if they're elected dem democratically? What's wrong with that? Let's move on to a question now from WBEZ's Dave McKinney. This is to all of you. Um, since 2015, 13 residents have died of Legionnaire's disease at a state-run veterans home in Quincy. As of this month, residents are still getting sick, actually last month, but many of you have criticized Governor Rauner for his administration's response to the crisis over there. What is your specific plan for preventing Legionnaire's disease at that home? And I'll start at this side here, Mr. Pritzker. Thank you. Well, first of all, it's because of Bruce Rauner's fatal mismanagement that so many people died at that Quincy home. And we need to recognize that we have to safeguard our veterans. So I believe that we should move the veterans out. In fact, uh, in Quincy, they have a facility that's just a, a block or two away where they could house those veterans temporarily. And then we need to either replace that facility or replace the plumbing in that facility and make sure that it is safe. Now remember, whatever it is that we do, two-thirds of those dollars will come from the federal government, only a third from the state. But Bruce Rauner hasn't gone after any of that. And in fact, the recent emails that were released about it seemed like he was just trying to cover his own butt. Mr. Kennedy? I mean, we need to build a new facility and we need to commit to taking care of the veterans to defend them in, as they uh, grow older, just as they defended us in their youth. What Governor Rauner has done to the veterans in that home is exactly what he did to the residents of the nursing homes he invested in when he was in private equity. It's exactly the same pattern of behavior. Strip out costs, put people at risk, end up with uh, dead patients, and then walk away from the problem. That's what he's done here. The state of Illinois, it's getting smaller, and average household income has gone up because Governor Rauner has chased the poor out of our state. What he's done in Quincy is emblematic of his entire uh, governorship. Senator Biss. Obviously, we need the resources to fund the appropriate replacement of the home in Quincy. What was allowed to happen there by the Rauner administration was grotesque. It's a fundamental violation of our most, most important moral values to protect and care for and honor those who have protected us. But I think we also ought to talk a little bit about accountability here. The Rounder administration was very focused on making sure nobody found out. They weren't so focused on figuring out what to do about it. The emails that you recently uh, uncovered show that, but their behavior for a long time before that showed that as well. And so we need to pair adequate resources to care for our veterans with real accountability. We need an administration that identifies problems and doesn't then start to hide them, doesn't pretend they're not there, and brings them out into the open, acts on them swiftly. That's the governor I'm going to be. Mr. Diver. You know, it shouldn't really have been a surprise when you have those types of issues that arise from such an administration because just like a household that can't pay their bills, they leave their infrastructure crumble because they can't repair things like plumbing. The same, the same thing was going on. You know, when you've got $16.5 billion of unpaid state bills, why are you thinking about the plumbing pipes at a veteran's home? It wasn't being thought about. And it's because of a poor administrative oversight. There's, there's no other excuse. You've got to own it. You know, and as governor, the thing I will do is I'll have quality people 
who will be working in my administration that will have knowledge of facilities, et cetera, and they will monitor it. That's what has happened, and as an Illinois resident, you have to own that. Mr. Hardiman? Well, I come from a military family. My son is a member of the National Guard, and I'm a patriot myself. I love my country. The reality is that we would have to move the uh, veterans out of that home there and, and uh, build a new one, really, and put them up. It doesn't matter how much it costs. We need to put place them somewhere where they could be safe and free of them situations. Governor Rauner is a governor right now that stated he was not in charge of the state of Illinois. And if a governor made that statement, then why would he have the, the nerve to run again to not be in charge for another four years? That's a question we need to ask everybody right here today. So I didn't expect him to do nothing for the uh, veterans there because he hasn't done nothing since he's been the governor here. Dr. Marshall. Yeah, all right. Well, I'm the only physician up yeah. here, and I know a little bit about this disease, and I'm the only veteran. By the way, I'm a Vietnam veteran, so I, this touched me a lot. Let me just educate you. Le Legionnaire's disease is a, a very devastating pulmonary disease. It really became known about a few decades ago in a hotel in... Uh, Philadelphia, and there was a Legionnaires meeting. Many died, and the hotel eventually had to be torn down. That's how bad this disease is, and that's probably what we're going to have to do in this uh, veteran's home. Yeah, we're going to have to tear it down and uh, transfer them or build a new home or something like that. Uh, this disease is that bad. Thank you, Dr. Marshall. You're listening to the Illinois Democratic Primary Forum for Governor from the University of Chicago Institute of Politics, Politico, and WBEZ. Let's continue now with a question from Politico's Natasha Karecki. Thank you. Uh, this, is, this is to everyone. Catherine Dillon submitted a question about how you'll foster a harassment-free work environment. What measures have you put in place in your campaign or in your workplace to protect employees from sexual harassment, bullying, or inappropriate conduct? Mr. Kennedy, let's start with you. I mean, I think the future behavior is best predicted by past behavior, and I'm very proud of my track record around uh, sexual harassment uh, training and dealing with those issues in a work environment. At the Merchandise Mart, half of the uh, corporate officers, vice presidents, and others were, were women, and there was an incredible effort on our part to create a work environment that would attract the best people from all around the United States. And to do that, we had to be harassment free. Um, I think the state of Illinois, the elected officials, I think the campaigns have an obligation as well. But what we've seen is covering over, papering over the real issue in our state, which occurs in the Democratic Party. And none of the public documents that the party has issued has addressed its own bad behavior. Just and a quick, but do you have uh, policies in place now in, sure, in, our in, campaign, in your campaign? Yeah, everybody has to go through sexual harassment training in, in our campaign. But it's not the campaigns where you're seeing the problems. You're seeing it when the Democratic Party sends an operative into a campaign full of bullying behavior. I'm in charge here. I'm, in, I'm the leader. Nobody talked back to me. And that is the same person. That bully who arrives on the scene is often the person committing the violations of sexual harassment policy. That's what's going on, and we have not addressed that Senator at the party Biss. level. Please. Yes, our campaign has a zero-tolerance policy for sexual harassment and sexual harassment policies that are posted in every office. We've held trainings for our staff. We will always do that when new staff come on board. That's the policy that my administration will have as well, an aggressive zero-tolerance policy. Zero-tolerance is part of why I've called for Mike Madigan to step down as Democratic Party chairman because of his failure to properly respond to the terrible incidents we've heard about in recent weeks. I also want to stress, though, that we're making a mistake if we pretend that the crisis of sexual harassment and assault is not part of a larger system of oppression, a system of misogyny that exists across our society. That's why we need to fight for economic justice. That's why I've vowed that my, camp, my cabinet will be majority female. That's why it's important to use every lever in the state government possible to lift up women in positions of power because the systems of oppression that keep women down are the systems of oppression that enable sexual harassment to persist. Mr. Diver. Uh, yes, uh, our campaign adopted the Illinois Democratic County Chairman's Association sexual harassment policy. We did a training and put that into place uh, shortly after that was made available. But I've also, uh, all the staff that works in my jurisdiction as a regional superintendent, has went through sexual harassment training. So uh, I'm not only accountable as a, a candidate, but as an elected official, because uh, when, when you 
are in government. There are many people that trans transition in and out. The difference between an office holder and being a candidate is the scrutinize uh, that you may entail if you are not on top of what's going on in your office. And uh, I'm very proud of that record. Mr. Hardiman. Yeah, Hardiman and Avery, we have a, a zero toler tolerance policy when it comes down to sexual harassment, and we plan to uplift women to the highest level here in the state of Illinois. It was also brought to my attention that women that work the same jobs that men work in Illinois, state employees, do not receive the same pay as men receive, and I plan to change that within the, next, within the first six months of the Hardiman and Avery administration. So we have that policy, yes. Dr. Marshall. Well, I've ex adopted the uh, county chairman's uh, policy also. Uh, my village, uh, when I was a village trustee over 26 years ago, we were one of the first ones in the state to adopt a sexual harassment uh, policy in writing, and that was over 26 years ago, one of the first ones in the state. I went to the Women's March, by the way, and I was assigned with a simple little uh, statement on it. It said, the women should be believed. Simple as that. If those women had been believed 10 years ago, we wouldn't be where we are now. If it 15 years ago, 20, if they'd been believed the first time, we wouldn't be in this situation now. Mr. Pritzker. My campaign has had a sexual harassment policy since the very beginning. And in fact, last year we held sexual harassment training sessions for all of our employees. I've also done that in my business. Um, and in our administration, we will have a zero tolerance policy and make sure that there are independent investigations that are done immediately upon allegations being made and women coming forward. I also want to say that we need to empower women more broadly. We need equal pay for equal work. We need to pass the ERA finally in the state of Illinois. And as I have been doing my whole life, we need to stand up for women's reproductive rights. And I'm proud to have the endorsement of Personal PAC, the state's pro-choice PAC. Let's move on now to a question from WBEZ's Tony Arnold. Uh, this is for everyone. Uh, University of Chicago student Katie Ashbaugh writes that state gun laws are proving ineffective in Chicago, and she wants to know what policies you will put in place to make Illinois safer. So uh, let's begin with Theo Hardiman. Uh, what's your number one priority for addressing gun violence? Well, I'm the only candidate running for governor. I'm the former director of Ceasefire Illinois. It's a proven public health model that gets results. We help reduce uh, shootings and homicides in several communities here in Chicago, about 80% in some communities. But I have to be honest with everybody that's here today. Uh, I have a two-pronged approach to reducing gun violence in Chicago, and we commit to reduce gun violence by 50%. One part of the approach is to work closely with the ATF and the state police to help intercept the illegal gun trafficking. And some people may not want to hear this, but 85% of all killings occur in the African-American community here in Chicago, and it's incumbent upon black leaders to organize with the young guys on the streets of Chicago and bring them to the table of peace. I plan to train and hire a violence prevention czar under my administration, his soul or her, their sole responsibility would be to go to these communities where we have a lot of gun violence and bring these young men to the table of peace, create, uh, create uh, jobs for them, apprenticeship programs, counseling, and some mental health services. So that's our plan. But I'm the only candidate up here, I have to be honest with you, that, that has a proven track record in reducing shootings and gun violence here in Chicago and nationally. Dr. Marshall? Okay. All the solutions that they're going to give won't work because we've been doing it for 35 years and they haven't worked. My solution is to realize why they're shooting each other. They're fighting over the drug money. You must take the money out of the drug trade. It worked 90 years ago when we did it for alcohol. Why wouldn't it work for drugs? We must legalize marijuana to take the money out of that. And you must decriminalize cocaine and opioids so that the addicts can go to a doctor and then to a pharmacist and get the medicine or get the thing that they're addicted to. You must take the money out of the drug trade. J.B. Pritzker. Well, let's recognize that there are 700 families in Chicago each year that are suffering the unimaginable grief of losing a loved one. And that means to me that we have to step up and change the laws in the state of Illinois and make it safer and get rid of the guns that are on the street. So I want to ban bump stocks. I want to ban assault weapons. I want to ban... Uh, high capacity magazines, and I think we got to pass that gun dealer licensing bill uh, and make sure that we have a governor who will sign all that legislation, which I'm doubtful we do today. 
So I also think we have to pass a budget that stands up for the services that people need, the human services like mental health facilities, um, like substance abuse treatment. These are things that have not been funded by Bruce Rauner. Uh, we also, I want to say one more thing. We also need to have violence interruption on the streets. I want to compliment T.O. Hardiman because he's been involved in ceasefire and now in violence interrupters. We need that program funded. We need to make sure that other programs that step up in the streets and interrupt that violence where it's occurring, that those programs are in place and that we expand them. Chris Kennedy. I mean, I'm painfully aware of the notion that violence, which can affect any family, will eventually affect every family. I like that question because it, it questions the, the role of state government and state laws. The Democratic Party had a supermajority in the state Senate, a supermajority in the state House, controlled the governor's mansion, and never passed a, a licensing bill. That's absurd. We need to do that here in the state of Illinois. But simply regulating guns is never going to be enough. Let's look at the communities that have done a good job. New York has the lowest homicide rate last year since 1959. They recognize that community policing matters. They recognize that opportunity is the enemy of violence, and economic oppression is its partner in crime. We can't have a system in Illinois and in the city of Chicago. Or in the city, there are 30 high schools that had an average ACT score of a 14 or a 15. The kids graduating like that are never going to be able to participate in the modern American economy. They're forced into committing crimes of survival. That's on all of us. We need to fund our schools properly so every kid has a chance. State Senator Daniel Biss. Well, we had an unthinkable tragedy in Parkland, Florida, but we have unthinkable tragedies in the state of Illinois as a result of gun violence every single day, and enough is enough. We had a good day in the Illinois General Assembly yesterday, sending a gun dealer licensing bill to Bruce Rauner's desk, a bill that, if signed into law, will save some lives. More bills passed one house or the other, a bill to create a lethal violence order of protection, a bill to ban bump stocks. We ought to ban assault, ban assault rifles. We ought to ban high-capacity magazines. We had a good day in the Illinois General Assembly yesterday, yes, in part, simply because of the unthinkable tragedy that occurred in Florida, but also because of the inspiring activism that followed it. Let's tell the truth. Generations have failed on this issue. A new generation of young people is going to succeed. Bob Diver, and that culture of activism you. is going to bring Bob us Diver? to a different kind of safety. Thank you. Um, Yesterday, uh, I opened my mail and Representative Davis had asked uh, a support for House Bill uh, 4880, which became House Bill 1467 to ban bump stocks. I wish I was the governor, Dan, because I would sign that legislation. I also would say, sign the legislation for uh, Gun Dealers Licensure Act because we have to stop the trafficking of guns like they came from Wisconsin to kill the police officer in the Thompson Center. That's our responsibility as government officials, but we've got to go further than that. And I want to tell you, we didn't get where we're at in a day, a week, a year, or two years. We have seen a cultural shift in our society of not valuing life. That's what it's about. And we have to instill in the generation, through mentoring youth that are at risk, as to what is right and what is wrong and what you do and what you do not do. Thank you, Bob Diver. We're going to move on to a question from Natasha Karecki of Politico. I'm going back to some of the workplace issues. Uh, this week, House Speaker Michael Madigan released short summaries of nine complaints from the past five years involving employees in his state office. Should Madigan step down as House Speaker or as Illinois Democratic Party Chairman over his handling of these and other harassment complaints? Um, we're looking for kind of a, on the shorter side, uh, answers here. We'll start with Mr. Pritzker. It took far too long for those uh, allegations to be investigated, honestly, to look in. People who report them, women who are brave enough to come forward, should have those allegations 
heard immediately. Now, that took too long, and now we need an independent investigation. We need to make sure it's completely independent of Michael Madigan, of his speaker's office, of the Democratic Party of Illinois that he controls. Should Mr. And that Madigan may resign? That we have somebody. I believe that anybody who is responsible needs to be held accountable, and that will include the speaker if it's him. Chris Kennedy? I think he needs to step away as chairman of the party, not speaker of the House. Chairman of the party until these investigations are concluded. There's two levels of investigations, one into the allegations themselves, and a second level, which is into whether or not the original investigations were designed to deny the complaining party their rights. I believe, in the best interest of the Democratic Party, that he needs to step away and show that we're about good government. State Senator Daniel Biss. Yes, Mike Madigan should step down as chairman of the Democratic Party of Illinois. I said that before that uh, list of nine cases was published, a list that raised way more questions than it answered. If we believe in zero tolerance, it has to start there. It's not surprising that J.B. Pritzker won't make that same call. He's Mike Madigan's candidate. He's waiting for Mike Madigan's permission. That's not the governor we need. Mr. Pritzker, your response? Well, I've been an independent leader my whole life, and I don't take orders from anybody. Um, I will say that uh, Daniel Biss, when he was in Springfield um, as a state representative, he was first elected with the help of Mike Madigan and lots of money from Mike Madigan, and then he voted for Speaker Madigan, and then he ran Speaker Madigan's super PAC, and he's collected hundreds of thousands of dollars from Springfield insiders. Um, frankly, I don't think you've got a leg to stand on when you're accusing others of being connected to Mike Madigan. Bob Diver, replay, should Michael Madigan resign? Sh should Bob, Bob Diver, should Mike Madigan resign? No. He should not, because if there's going to be an investigation, let's find out if he was wrong. If he's Hardeman? not wrong, if he's not wrong, why do we wrong him? And perhaps he should not be reelected to be speaker, or perhaps he should not be reelected to become the party chairman. But I am not for asking anyone to resign because an allegation has been made against them. Theo Hardiman. If Mike Madigan ignored the allegations for a period of time and did not appropriately deal with that matter, uh, he should step down in that regard. Yes, indeed because uh, we must respect women to the highest level. Dr. Marshall? Oh, this is baloney. He's not gonna step down. My three-state plan solves the problem. <laughs> he goes back to Chicago. So do you think he should step free. down or not? He should step down. He ain't he, please step down, go ahead. <laughs> You're listening to the Illinois Democratic Primary Forum for Governor here from the University of Chicago with the Institute of I'm Politics, honest. Politico, and WBEZ. <laughs> Let's go to a question from WBEZ's Dave McKinney for all the candidates. This campaign has been framed as a battle for the hearts of middle and low income voters. And since that's the case, we're going to do a simple test to see how connected each of you is to uh, average Illinoisans. We're going to give you each the name of a different staple or service that people rely upon, and we're going to ask each of you to tell us how much it costs. Just to see how connected you are, and this is in honor of the Price is Right. It's a deep one. <laughs> so, Mr. Pritzker, I'd like to start with you. What does a week of child care, of daycare for one child cost? Uh, about $150 at the low end. High end? Probably $400. Mr. Kennedy, a haircut. This, this good? <laughs> I pay up for them. Uh, I pay $40 for my haircut. Senator Biss, a, a full price monthly CTA pass. A monthly CTA pass. So let's see, my Metro pass has now come pretty close to $50 a month. So a monthly CTA pass, I would guess, is probably around 35 uh, Mr. Diber, a 28-ounce uh, jar of peanut butter. Uh, 265. <laughs> Mr. Hardiman, an oil change. Oh, oil change is about $39, roughly. And I started to duck when you got to me. <laughs> but right. the thing is about $39. I get my oil change all the time. All right. all right. Dr. Marshall, you get the last word here. Uh, a gallon of gas. Around 275, something like that. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have time for a very brief lightning round of questions, and this is for, the all, for all the candidates. We're going to go very quick. It's going to be kind of like a roll call. To begin, should the state force local school districts to allow transgender students to use the restroom or locker room of their choice? Mr. Pritzker, yes or no? Let's begin with you. Only a yes or no? 
Yes, and the Illinois State Board of Education needs to be in charge of putting that policy in place. Chris Kennedy. Yes. Daniel Biss. Yes, and I support a constitutional amendment to protect LGBTQ rights that would enable that to be the case. Bob Diver. Yes, but I don't think they should force them. It should be at their own will. T.O. Hardiman. During my career as a peacemaker, I actually saved the lives of two transgender women on the west side of Chicago in the past. But my answer is yes, and I do support the LGBT community. Dr. Robert Marshall. No. Next Just question. Just think about it. You're, there's <laughs> 2,000 students in a high school, yeah. and, and you're going to favor one or two over the other 1,998? No, we're going to they should, the rights they should of we make provisions Thank for you. them, but forcing people, we shouldn't do that. Thank you. One last question submitted from the public from Gary Evans. Do you support term limits for state elected officials, Dr. Robert Marshall? Yes, and it has to be done equally across the board. Dr. Uh, Teal Hardiman. I support term limits and also uh, support uh, reduction in pay for state senators and state representatives because it's a part-time job anyway, and we can save some tax dollars that way. Bob Diver. Yes, I do. Daniel Biss. I support term limits for legislative leaders like uh, Speaker of the House, Senate President, Minority Leader. I support term limits for the governor, and I'm term limiting myself as a legislator. Chris Kennedy. I support term limits. J.B. Pritzker. I support leadership term limits and believe that we ought to have elections that are more competitive and get rid of gerrymandering in the state. Thank you. At this time, we're going to move on to the candidates' one-minute closing statements. We've randomly mm. selected the order in which they'll speak. Mr. Kennedy, we're going to start with you. 60 seconds. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. We've appeared all over the state, and it's great to be on a university campus and see a turnout this large. As we look to the election on March 20th, there's a clear choice, a choice between the status quo, a choice that embraces the direction that the state is headed in, a choice that represents an embrace of the Democratic Party as it is today in Illinois. And if you like where we're headed, you should vote for either Senator Biss or, or for J.B. Pritzker. If you want change, radical change in Illinois, if you want to abandon this fraudulent system of property taxes, if you want to fully fund our schools, if you want economic development across the state driven by universities and highly educated grade school and high school kids, come and work on my campaign. Thank you all very much. Daniel Biss. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and to have this conversation. We are facing a unique moment in American politics, a time when fewer and fewer people have more and more and more, and we're facing a critical time in Illinois where Bruce Rauner has taken the state apart brick by brick over three years. The question facing us as Democrats right now is, is it enough to only beat Bruce Rauner and go back to whatever we had before and call that good enough? Or is it time to build a different kind of political movement to transform our state. We have a fundamental choice in this election. We can look at a situation with Bruce Rauner in the governor's mansion and Donald Trump in the White House and say, inexperienced wealthy businessmen who buy their way into office must be the solution. Or we can look at that and say it's time for a middle class progressive. It's time for an organizer to build a movement to make change. It's time for us to cast off the straitjacket of the past and actually create the Illinois that we have known for these many years we could have but has been inaccessible because of a cramped vision and a politics that shut most of us out. Thank you, Mr. Biss. Bob Diver. Thank you. you. You know, as was said earlier, I'm the true Democrat because I am not of wealth. I'm from the working class. I'm the only candidate that's been in leadership and organized labor, paid 28 years of union dues. That was the backbone of the Democratic Party. That still is the backbone of the Democratic Party. That's what I represent. And that's what I base a lot of my values around, working class people like my parents were. But I want you to imagine this, that for 20 years, a Democrat from Southern Illinois never stepped up to run for governor or a constitutional office in this state. So why is that? Is it because you have to be from Chicago? You've got to be where you can raise millions of dollars to do this? I've proved that system wrong. And I'll prove the system wrong that a middle class guy like me from downstate can't go to the governor's office and govern in the state. So I say to you, do you want more of what you've had or do you really want to change the state? Do you want to change Springfield? For those of you that want to defeat Mike Madigan, you have to elect Bob Diver. I'm Thank not you, Mr. Diver. Thank Tio you. Thank you. Hardiman. 
Yeah, once again, Tia Hardiman, I ran for governor in 2014, secured close to 30% of the state vote, winning 30 counties downstate. My running mate, her name is Patricia Avery. She's a former Champaign County commissioner. She used to oversee a budget of $80 million. Uh, we have a 2020 plan, which represents a perfect vision for, to move the state of Illinois forward. In that plan, it includes supporting the veterans, the seniors, the college students, the progressive tax, $15 minimum wage, child care service providers, people with disabilities, and the list goes on and on. If you want a proven leader, a leader that's not going to have to drink some chocolate milk to show he supports diversity like Rauner did, I want you all to really take a look at voting for T.O. Hardiman. If you want something different, we must do something different. I'm a viable candidate in this race with a proven track record. You can look me up. All hands on deck, and that's what this campaign is about. The question came to me earlier about all the money. I've attended every debate. We have campaign literature in Southern Illinois, Central Illinois, Lake County, all through Cook County. We have not missed a beat in this campaign. I have the energy of about maybe 100 people. Thank you, And we're going to leave this state. Thank you very much. Robert Marshall. All right. Well, all right. Well, thank you for having me here. Um, I've already stated uh, why you should vote for me. If you're satisfied with the establishment, the way that the situation is in this state, don't vote for me. I'm an anti-establishment candidate, and I have ideas that nobody has. Please at least look at my ideas objectively and give them a thought. Marijuana, casino gambling, dividing this state up into three brand new states. I'm running because I, have a, I present a combination to people that it's very hard to find. I'm moderate or a little progressive on social issues, many of which we haven't discussed, but I'm very conservative when it comes to taxes and spending and balancing the budget. That combination is, is very hard to find, and that's what I am. Thank you, Mr. Marshall. Davey Prisker. Well, I'm running for governor because everything that we care about is under siege by a racist, misogynist president in Washington, D.C., and by his local silent partner, Governor Bruce Rauner. My parents taught me to fight for social and economic justice, for equality and inclusion, and that's why I've tried to go get big things done that fill those values. So there are hundreds of thousands of kids who get school breakfast in low-income school districts because I expanded President Obama's program. And there are thousands of kids that get quality preschool and quality child care because I've been an advocate for more than 20 years. And I led the building of the Illinois Holocaust Museum that teaches more than 60,000 kids to fight bigotry and hatred and intolerance. And I've created thousands and thousands of jobs. You need a governor who's got experience doing big things because we have big things we need to do here in the state. We need a quality education for every child, we need universal health care, and we need to create jobs. I'm J.B. Pritzker, I'm gonna go beat Bruce Rauner, and I'm gonna put Springfield back on the side of working families. Thank you, we have a moment for one last question that we received from the public, it's a yes or no. Do you pledge to support the eventual Democratic nominee and campaign for them, Dr. Marshall? That's difficult for me. <laughs> T.O. Hardiman. Uh, without a doubt. Bob Diver. I always have and always will. Daniel Biss. I'll spend as much energy and effort on this per the nominee, whether it's me or somebody else. I hope the same is true of everybody, everybody on this stage, including J.B. Pritzker. Chris Kennedy. Uh, I will, yes. And J.B. Pritzker. From the beginning, I've said I'll support the nominee. I think it'll be me. And with that, we conclude the Illinois Democratic Gubernatorial Candidates Forum. We thank all the candidates for governor for being with us. J.B. Pritzker, Chris Kennedy, State Senator Daniel Biss, Bob Diber, Dr. Robert Marshall, and Tio Hardiman. Let's offer a round of applause for our candidates. Thanks as well to our audience here at the University of Chicago. Thanks to our partners, Politico and the University of Chicago's Institute of Politics. Just to note that we invited the Republican candidates for governor, Governor Bruce Rauner mm -hmm. and State Representative Jeannie Ives to also appear in a candidate forum, but we did not hear from Governor Bruce Rauner. The candidates have been invited to answer additional questions from the audience here at the University of Chicago following this broadcast, which you can see on Facebook Live next via WBEZ's Facebook page. Thanks to our reporters, Natasha Karecki from Politico and Tony Arnold and Dave McKinney from WBEZ. Thanks to our broadcast director, Carrie Shepard. Andrew Gill directed the video and our technical director is Adam Yaffe. Thanks to our listeners on Illinois Public Radio, Northern Public Radio, and at Southern Illinois University. Thank you for joining us. Illinois' primary election is March 20th. I'm Mel Ballara. Have a good evening.
Great. At this time, we're going to hear some questions from the audience members. We've selected a group with questions that we receive via Harkin, which is the platform we use to get questions for Curious City. And we've invited those members to head over to the microphone now that's here at the center aisle at our venue this evening. Uh, you're standing there with WBEZ's B. Bosco. Questioners, tell us your name and where you're from. Our first questioner, go ahead. My name is Matt LaFond. I am a graduate student here at the University of Chicago. Uh, my question is, college education has become prohibitively expensive for many. What is your solution to this issue, and how would you pay for it? Let's start with Chris Kennedy. The, the, the great driver in America of economic development in any state that's ever worked well in multiple cities, multiple decades, is the power of higher education. It's what drives the success of Silicon Valley, of Austin, Texas, of Research Triangle, North Carolina, of Pittsburgh, of Akron, of Boston, New York. And it is what's driving the success of the city of Chicago, which has emerged as the largest college town in America. Making college affordable is critical to the success, not only of the next generation, but of our entire economy. I was proud at the University of Illinois that even as we were furloughing employees, we put $100 million aside to make the university more affordable. The greatest challenge in Illinois right now is the state government and the budget cuts to our universities. I think we need to put a billion dollars more in our system of higher education, and I would pay for it with the five taxes that I described earlier. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. Bob Diber? Sure. Well, first of all, thank you for uh, being a graduate student in the state of Illinois, and you didn't leave like 16,000 other kids did. So thank you. Uh, being a product of the university system in the state of Illinois, undergraduate and graduate, uh, I had a quality education. It was a time in which Illinois was investing in their students. You know what we did in 2012, we went away from that and we slashed that. And we haven't had a governor that was willing to say their first appropriation would be education. As governor, my first approach bill that I'll sign will be to reinstate funding for higher ed at the 2012 level, the last year that it was funded fully, and you're going to ask me, how can you do that? We have more revenue today than we did in 12, and higher ed has less money. So why is that? It's because of the choice your governor makes. So that's what I will do to reinstate it. I will take money from the progressive income tax model that I've laid out, and I will invest in research on our campuses because that's why I went to Eastern Illinois University, is because there was research going on there, and that's why students go to universities. Thank they you, Bob Diver. Let's go to State Senator Daniel Biss. We made a decision many generations ago as a society. We said, hey, listen, it's become necessary to have an equal shot in a modern economy, to have an access to a high school education, and therefore we created free access to public elementary and secondary school, and that revolutionized economic opportunity in this country for the exact same reason, by the precise same logic. We have a moral responsibility to go to free access to public higher education here in the state of Illinois and across the country because the economy has changed and because the new economy demands that access for people to have an equal shot in the economy. I'm the only person on the stage who's fighting for this. Probably not surprising that I'm also the person who uh, our family just finished about six years ago paying off our student loans. You ask how to pay for it. That's a challenge. It's going to be a process. But that's why I'm also the person who's not taking revenue options off the table. We need to be bold when we think about the way to build a tax code for a modern economy, the way to transform our tax code as our economy has transformed, because that's how to have a government that works for a modern society. Theo Hardiman? Yeah, I would like to see college students uh, be able to uh, go to college uh, free up until the bachelor's degree level. And we would pay for it with uh, legalizing small amounts of recreational use as marijuana. It's going to cost roughly about a billion dollars, you know, overall. But I believe in free college education. I'm currently serving as an adjunct professor in the field of criminal justice, so I understand how it goes. For college students, I've been there, I've done that. I've had to pay back a student loan myself. So as your governor, I plan to really make sure that college, as long as a person uh, maintains a, a certain GPA, I plan to make sure we have free college up until the bachelor's degree level, young man. J.B. Pritzker. Right. Thank you, Matt. It's a great question. And I want to remind everybody that under Bruce Rauner, nearly 72,000 fewer students go to school here in the state of Illinois in higher ed. 72,000. And about 80% of those people that leave to go to school somewhere else don't come back to the state. So we're losing not just our economic resources, 
but we're also losing our kids. We need to reverse that. We need to actually invest in our universities and our community colleges, and we need to make sure that we're stepping up for MAP grants and keeping our faculty and the programs that are here in place. Bruce Rauner wants to merge these universities together, but it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. You drive a whole bunch of people out of the state, and then you say, well, gee, we don't need all these facilities. Let's close them down. I believe that we need to build them back up because the future economic condition of the state of Illinois is dependent upon the talent that we produce historically and today. But you've got to invest in that talent. Dr. Robert Marshall. Well, we need to find new sources of income. We can't keep hitting up the, the property tax owner or the, or the income taxes. We have to have new sources. And I'm the only one that's really brought up the uh, possibility of casino gambling for uh, Chicago. It's 55 million well-heeled people coming into this study. That's an enormous amount of new money. And I'm the only one that's mentioned that. But by the way, why is it so expensive to go there? These people won't mention that at all. But you're paying for two colleges. One is working and one is not working. The pensions in this state are the big problem. They don't mention that at all. I have a lot of ideas to reform pensions. That's what we need in this state. Thank you, Mr. Dr. Marshall. Let's go to our next questioner. Uh, tell us your name and where you're from. Good evening, candidates. My name is Ivan Parfenoff, and I've born and raised in Chicago, stayed in the city my whole life. I graduated from the university here in 2016. So my question's about criminal justice. The coalition to end money bond reports that recent reforms haven't ended the jailing of people simply for being too poor to afford bond. <clears throat> Will you address this issue for all of Illinois? Let's start with you, T.O. Hardiman. Yeah, I'm one of the only candidates uh, standing up here today. I, I worked to close down Sam's uh, Tam Supermax prison. I visited prisons throughout Illinois to help improve conditions, working with the members of the General Assembly. But the no-cash bills, I'm definitely in favor of that, especially for nonviolent offenders. And I represent the uh, agenda for the ex-offenders. I've hired over 300 ex-offenders during my career with ceasefire, so I have a proven track record being a champion for that cause. So the answer is uh, we would do away with uh, cash bills for nonviolent offenses, okay? J.B. Pritzker. All right. We absolutely need to end cash bail for nonviolent crimes, and we also need to work on res reducing recidivism in this state. We put forward a criminal justice reform plan that addresses that and many more issues. My running mate, State Representative Juliana Stratton, has spent more than 20 years as a, an advocate in the criminal justice reform um, uh, policy area and is at UIC uh, at an institute that helps bring together the police and communities to restore trust. We have a lot of work to do. We've got to stand up for our juveniles. You know, that I, I funded the Center on Wrongful Convictions at Northwestern University that helps people who've been wrongly convicted get out of prison and the Child and Family Justice Center, which recently put forward a bill that got passed and signed that expunges the records of juveniles who stay out of trouble after two years after being in the system. Chris Kennedy. So we have a comprehensive criminal justice plan that addresses some of the issues that you've raised, but let me be specific on the issue of cash bail. We have criminalized poverty in the United States. The judge that sets your bail often determines your sentence. That's not how we should operate in America. We should ban cash bail across all of Illinois. Bail should be decided, or. Uh, the release should be decided based on dangerousness, not on how much money you have. If you're a danger to society, you shouldn't be able to buy your way out of, out of jail. If you're a danger, you should be kept there. If you're not a danger, whether you have money or not, you should be released. That's the decision point that every judge should make, not how much money you have. Daniel Biss. Our criminal justice system is racist. Mass incarceration is racist. The roots of it are racist, and the application of it is racist, and the consequences are vicious. And so we need bold, dramatic criminal justice reform. And yes, one important piece of that is ending the criminalization of poverty, which means, yes, ending cash bond without question, but it also means changing this structure of constant fees and fines that affect release date, that are literally criminalized in some cases. The inability, the inability to pay a fee becomes another crime. Or how about this? We passed a law last year that seals certain records to give people, after returning into their neighborhoods, the opportunity to apply for a job, except your record can't be sealed if you have outstanding fines, which means if you don't have a job, so you can't pay the fines, you can't get a job, so you can't pay the fines. 
We need bold criminal justice reform policy and enough of this system that cowardly politicians are scared of looking soft on crime and losing their next election. It's time to end this racist system. Bob Diver. Yes, yesterday we laid out an extensive criminal justice policy reform program and uh, ending cash bail was part of it. But you know what's worse than cash bail is if, if you can't pay the bail and you're in, and you're in jail and you experience forfeiture of your property because then you've got uh, really a, a double problem in your personal life because you can't reclaim it. You've got to go to court to get it, and it's just wrong. So this is all part of what we need to examine as part of the cash bail, and yes, it does need to be revised. But, you know, to, to take this a step further, you know, Juvenile Justice um, Council started getting it right with Senate Bill 100 when we looked at ways that we prevent young people from really entering into incarceration. And we need to take that Juvenile Justice Council work and we need to move it forward a, another step in the state of Illinois. Thank you for the question. Dr. Marshall. Yeah, I think we should have reform. Oh, by the way, you realize if you got rid of the war on drugs in this state and in this country, a lot of your, your question would be moot. They wouldn't be arrested in the first place. Legalizing marijuana, decriminalizing cocaine and opioids, you wouldn't, your question would be moot. Thank you, Dr. Marshall. Let's move on to our next questioner. Tell us your name and where you're from. Hi, I am Doc Chauhan, and I'm a first year undergraduate at the University of Chicago from San Francisco Bay Area. And my question is this. How would you prevent the current administration's effort towards curbing federal student aid, and how would you deal with Illinois student debt? So, Dash, is that two questions? One question about curbing federal student aid, and then a second one about dealing with Illinois' debts. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Let's start with the student aid question. Daniel Biss, let's start with you. How would you prevent the current administration's efforts for curbing federal student aid? Well, unfortunately, we can't prevent any of the nightmares coming out of Betsy DeVos's Department of Education, but we can fight back in important ways. We have seen, unfortunately, parallel activity on the state level as MAP grants, crucial grants that are often the lifeline, that are the difference between affordability and not, have been curtailed. As, they, as letters went out to students across the state promising tuition assistance, and then because there was no budget, the money wasn't there. So I've already stated what my long-term goal is regarding tuition, and I think that must be the goal. That's the only moral option. But in the meantime, we need to step up these MAP grants to make sure that we're filling in a void that is tragically and unconscionably left behind by a federal government that is simply not on the side of Illinois students. And Chris Kennedy, how would you prevent the current administration's efforts for curbing federal student aid? I don't know that there's much that we can do about the Trump administration. I think we need to fight them on every aspect of everything they do every day. I think we need to jam them up any way we can. But, but our obligation in the state of Illinois is to, to make sure that the people of Illinois and people who visit here have an inexpensive way to get through college because it is these universities and the highly educated young people that determine the outcome of our future. We can provide inexpensive college education. We can provide community college education for people. And we can, we can link that university system like they have in the state of California. The state of California is a $6 billion budget surplus this year. A lot of that credit goes to, the, to Governor Brown, but much of it should go to his father, who developed a world-class network of community colleges, colleges, and, and research universities. And that's what we should do in the state of Illinois. J.B. Pritzker. Well, there's a lot that a governor of Illinois can do, actually, on the federal level. Remember that earlier this year, Donald Trump tried to take away a million people's health care in the state of Illinois and, and repeal the Affordable Care Act. Governors, Republican and Democrat, got together to make their voices heard. Not our governor, unfortunately. He's, he's okay with taking a million people's health care away. Similarly, we have a voice in Washington, D.C. I'm proud to have the endorsement of Senator Dick Durbin, Senator Tammy Duckworth, Representative Sherry Bustos, and I'm working with federal officials. I think we, as, as governor, we can go work with our federal officials to fight Donald Trump to make sure to address this student aid issue. Now, the student debt issue, I think we have a, an opportunity here in the state of Illinois. You may remember that Alderman Amea Pawar was a candidate in this race. And uh, I, you know, I'll take good ideas wherever they come. 
And Amea Pawar had a really interesting idea. And the idea was to use the Illinois State Board of Education's ability to borrow to help people who have high interest on their student debt trade it in for a lower interest rate to use the bonding authority of the ISBE. I think that's an interesting idea. It would help people lower their payments on their student loans by hundreds or even thousands of dollars every year. We should look into that. Dr. Robert Marshall. Well, I've already answered half of this question. The student loans can be uh, uh, subsidized from the casino money in Chicago. There's 55 million well-heeled people coming in there, and uh, that's a lot, uh, big source of money right there. For Mr. Trump, the solution to him uh, is pretty good, uh, pretty obvious, I think. There's going to be an election in about eight months, and you can send him a message. There's going to be a lot of congressmen running, and if you can turn them out, you'll give him uh, the, the, the message. And Teal Hardiman, how uh, would you prevent the current administration's efforts for curbing federal student aid? Well, first of all, I would work with the U.S. senators, the congressmen, and see what we can work out a plan to present it to Donald Trump. He is the president. He's not going anywhere, any, anywhere fast anyway. But I would also, in Illinois, what I would do is work on reduce a student debt forgiveness. We can look at explore ways to kind of reduce the debt, reduce the interest, because I just finished paying a student loan myself about 15 years ago. So I know the burden to pay a student loan. So that's what we would do. And how we would pay for or reduce uh, student loan forgiveness is with legalize, uh, the financial transaction tax. House Bill 453, and that's the financial transaction tax. As soon as I become the governor, I would sign that bill into law, and we would raise the money to, for student debt forgiveness, which is very important to a lot of students all throughout the state. Bob Diver? Sure. No. Uh, for, first and foremost, you know, uh, State Treasurer Michael Frerichs uh, is working on cooperatives with states throughout the Midwest to help with financing of many different programs. And as governor, I would encourage that to take place for financing uh, students' college tuition as well and for families' investments in college uh, education. My wife, Karen, and I, we have two growing children that are public university students. We know the high price of uh, college education today, and we're paying that tuition. We know the debtedness of it. And I, I want to tell you that a lot of students don't know about debt forgiveness programs, so I'm going to share one with you right now. Very briefly, please. Bob Horace Diver. Mann. Horace Mann uh, of Illinois has a debt forgiveness program. So look into that. We're going to stay with you, Bob Diver, for the second part of the question. How would you deal with Illinois' debts? Ooh. Well, I've said this straight up, that... Is in being governor, I would ask that I get the bond to bond out the debt. All $9 million of unpaid bills, pay them off in 90 days. We owe them anyway. The right thing to do is to pay your bills, refinance your debt, put your debt interest into a manageable budget, and move on with a better managed state. It's the only way to do it other than raising taxes. So you would borrow money to pay the backlog of bills? I would borrow money, and I would save taxpayers money because last year you and I wasted one billion dollars of state revenue on interest in excess of a billion dollars it's not talked about and today you and i paid about 10 million dollars of interest again on bills that are not paid and that's why we do not have any money in this state teal hardman how would you pay illinois debts well first of all we have a looming pension crisis of uh, spending about nine billion dollars a year 25 million dollars a day on the pensions right now so what i would do is with the combined taxes that i propose Progressive tax, and we have to be honest with the taxpayers out there. It's going to take a constitutional amendment in order for the pro progressive tax to become law here, and that may take two years. But with the progressive tax, financial business, tra financial transaction tax, legalizing small amounts of recreational use marijuana, and decriminalizing it, you know, and making sure we commute the sentences of people that were locked up for marijuana crimes, those three combined taxes can bring in about three, about nine billion dollars projected income here in the state, and we would use at least 50 percent of that those funds to help pay down some of the debt, you know, every year here in Illinois till we get it back on track. Would because, you borrow money as well? Uh, no, I don't have no intention on borrowing money. We already have problems. We have a $35 billion budget. I think it's just being mismanaged. We would have to look at where we can cut some. That's why I mentioned earlier some of the state reps, uh, state senators should take a 10% pay cut so we can save some tax money here because it's a part-time job. Everybody working in the General Assembly had part other jobs. And we need to make this work for all the working class and poor people in Illinois. Robert that's Marshall, what I would do. Yes. let's go to Thank you. How would you deal with Illinois' debts? This is one of the advantages of my program of dividing the state up. This gives you the possibility of refinancing everything. Right now, you, there's very little you can do. You, it requires a, a constitutional amendment. States cannot de declare bankruptcy. 
my plan is just 50% plus one to break the state up. Each state, each new state will be new, and you'll re, they can refinance and renegotiate everything, including the pensions. These pensions are underfunded or unfunded. They're overpromised. They're grossly overpromised. You've got uh, 17,000 people who get pensions of $100,000 or more. They have to be renegotiated, and the only way to do it is either by bankruptcy, you can't do that, or you can do what I do, divide the state up into three brand new states with the ability to renegotiate everything. Dr. Marshall, in the event that we don't break up the states into three, <laughs> would you borrow money no, to pay for the bills? No, not me. All right, no, thank you. No, you have to pay it off very slowly. J.B. Pritzker. Well, under Bruce Rauner, we haven't had a balanced budget, not one year, and he never proposed one as is constitutionally required. He's the biggest deficit spender in the history of the state of Illinois. We have billions of dollars of unpaid bills, and under him, as Bob Diver just pointed out, we wasted a billion dollars in fees and interest because we pay 12% as a state on those unpaid bills, 12% interest. We should have refinanced that from the very beginning. So look, We've got to recognize that to balance the budget, there are three components, not two. There are expenditures and what your priorities are for the state. There are revenues, and then there's growth. And we need to get growth going in the state. We need to actually create jobs and have economic growth because that increases the coffers of the state, the revenues, without having to raise taxes. Chris Kennedy. I, I, would, I would bond out the debts of the state of Illinois. And maybe that sounds like borrowing, but we're already borrowing. We're just borrowing from the people that we owe the money to, and we're paying them an outrageously high interest rate. And the point of borrowing and bonding out is you just lower the interest rate, drive down our costs by maybe a billion dollars a year. That's what I'd do. Daniel Biss. I thought the question was about student loan debt. Was it not? That was the first question. The second one was how would you deal with Illinois debts? Right. right. I got lost on the three <laughs> states myself. <laughs> So Daniel right. Biss, how would you deal with Illinois' debts? Well, listen, we've talked a lot about revenue solutions. We need to transform a tax code for a modern economy. We need to have a sustainable and balanced budget. It's true that Bruce Rauner has never even introduced a balanced budget, but it's also true that through much of Illinois' history, even when we had sort of theoretically almost balanced budgets, they were balanced through a gimmick. They were balanced through a one-time revenue source. They were balanced if you only really squinted a lot. And what we actually need is not to try to balance the budget like it's a spreadsheet and the numbers add up and we walk away and pretend that's good enough. We need to balance it over the course of a long-term trajectory because ultimately what's going to solve our state's fiscal problems is if people have confidence in us. That confidence comes from a sustainable, balanced budget where someone can look at that and say, I see what it is now. I see it's going to be better in a decade. I see it's going to be better a decade after that. And I have confidence the debts will be paid down. Thank you very much to all our Democratic candidates who have been so generous with their time tonight. Thank you to J.B. Pritzker, to Chris Kennedy, to Daniel Biss, to Bob Diver, to Teal Hardiman, and Dr. Robert Marshall. Thank you so much. Thank you for our audience members, too, that helped us with our questions this evening. That wraps up our Q&A segment with the Democratic candidates. Thanks again to our partners, Politico and the University of Chicago Institute of Politics. Thank you all for joining us. Good night.